Hello folks, so this is the video for your academic writing essay writing tutorial that we had on Tuesday the 12th of November. This is just to remind you of the points that I made in the, the workshop for those who weren't there and just to add a couple of additional points as well that have occurred since this morning. Okay, so we've obviously got to go through essay structure, what makes a good essay, what makes a really bad one and how you go about referencing, as I know referencing can cause quite a lot of anxiety in people. So the main essentials are very simple. Number one, make sure you know what you're being asked to do. Different assignments will have different criteria. That isn't just the word count, that is involving with the actual question, the kind of material you'll be using and how you write it. Remember, when you're writing a science essay, such as the genetics essay, you want to use third person passive tense, never first person. If you're writing a reflective piece of work, however, for your portfolio, you want to use first person tense. If you're not sure what I mean about third person passive, effectively it's saying this was done, that was done, the results show that, instead of, I did this, I did that, I think that, okay? It's always helpful to plan your assignments so you're clear about how you're going to actually address the question. So set out your main ideas. You want to be leading your reader through your answer in a logical, progressive manner so that they follow it through easily. Most people don't actually read the question properly, so it's useful to highlight key words such as explain, describe, contrast, etc. So you make sure you're actually answering the question that's been asked. You always need to check your word count as well. Usually for pharmacy, assignments we will accept plus or minus 10% of the word count. So if you have a 1,000 word assignment, anything from 900 to 1,100 words would be acceptable. The purpose of the word count isn't just to ensure that you keep your assignments to a standard length, it's there to ensure that you learn how to write concisely. As a result, for the genetics essay particularly, if you go over the word count significantly, you will lose marks. Okay, so I mentioned about planning your answer. You can write an answer plan for this. It's useful for some people to bullet point key elements that they want to include in their answer. Remember you need to keep a standard essay structure. We'll come on to that in the next slide. You then use your plan to guide your research. It's far easier to know where to start if you know what it was you actually want to say. You want to guide the reader through your answer, so you want to be logical in how you put your plan together, so that when you research your answer, you start to form a logical story. Read your question again before you start to actually write your assignment. You want to use your plan to identify any areas that you may have missed. For example, if you have a question that asks you to compare and contrast, you may find that you've compared the processes but you've forgotten to contrast them. That's why you want to reread your question and just make sure that you've covered everything fully. Good essays have a solid structure and the standard essay structure includes an introduction, the main body of your answer and a conclusion together with a reference list, it's also known as a bibliography. Your introduction sets the scene, so you use it to inform the reader of the question that is asked and how you intend to answer it. Remember, for the science components, you're writing in third person passive, so you wouldn't say, I intend to answer this question. What you would say is, the question asked is X, Y, Z. In this essay, these processes will be discussed, for example. The main body of your answer logically works through the points you've identified in your plan. 
Remember, your marker won't see the plan you've put together. That is purely for you to guide your research and to guide your work. So your main body of the answer has to contain the bulk of what you want to say. It has to include the details as you lead your reader through. Finally, the concluding paragraph summarises the essay and may include areas of future work and development, for example. It's useful sometimes to relate back to the title at this point and to explain how you've gone about answering the question. When you actually start to write your essay, you don't have to start at the beginning. Some people find writing an introduction very difficult and it can help to start writing the actual main body of the text first. At this point, don't worry about word count, this is just a draft. The idea of the first draft is to put everything you can think of down, then walk away and come back to it in a few days time. Once you've done your draft and you've had a break from it, you'll have a clear head so it can help you then to actually edit your drafts. Some people prefer to edit a virtual copy on a screen, others prefer to have a hard copy. The main thing here is to be really brutal with what you've written. If you don't understand what you've written, rewrite it. If you find that you've missed important points, you need to put a mention to yourself, actually in your draft, that you need to add something at that point. It's worth putting those pointers in instead of actually just thinking, I need to add something about this section here. If you don't write it down, you will forget. Draft as many times as you need to. It doesn't matter. Your staff won't see the draft you write. For some assignments, you're allowed to actually submit a single draft for feedback from a marker. That's the case in third year and fourth year with project proposals and actual research projects. For the genetics essay, I can't accept a draft simply because of the time scale. I wouldn't be able to give everyone feedback in enough time for you to then write the essay. For academic writing, there are three main types of styles used in writing. This is different from scientific versus flective. So we have descriptive, which is factual and logical. It's going through points. Argumentative gives both sides of the argument. So it could be a for or against, compare, contrast. Compare and contrast also falls under evaluative writing. In this case, we're evaluating similarities and differences. And again, that can actually come under argumentative as well, depending on what you're writing. You may find that you use all three of these in one essay or use different styles of writing depending on the subject matter. Anything like that is absolutely fine. OK, so here's a really good example of an essay. This has been taken directly from the monash.edu.au site and has been substantially shortened. <laughs> Obviously, an essay should be rather longer than this, but this shows the main points I want to get across. So the very first thing they've done is they've actually stated the issue clearly, right in the first paragraph. This is the introduction. They've also gone through and referenced in the introduction and throughout the essay. It's not enough to reference in the text or in a reference list. You must do both. The essay continues to reference all the way through the work. And in their concluding paragraph, <coughs> they've summarised the essay. They've gone back and relinked with the original question. And they've then suggested that these possibilities you know, of carrying work forward into the future. Finally, they have referenced at the bottom in their reference section and the references are complete. You don't have to reference um, alphabetically in your genetics essay. It's better to write them just as, as they appear in the text. Notably, the language is appropriate for the subject. No jargon has been used. Any 
abbreviations that they've used, they've spelled out in full first. For example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has been written out in full in the first paragraph. At point of the essay that isn't actually shown here, it's simply referred to as the ABS. So they've already said the Australian Bureau of Statistics, brackets, ABS, close brackets. So it's clear to the reader what the abbreviation means. And last but not least, you must annotate your references. This is to tell the reader what you've taken from that reference. And it gives us proof that you have actually read it. Okay, so good essays will state the question clearly, logically work through the points and summarise their answers. They'll use clear English and the grammar and spelling will be checked. You have spell checker on your computers. Use it. Remember that spell checker will only catch letters and words that are either in the wrong place or misspelt. It won't necessarily catch correctly spelt words that have been used in the wrong way. Think of there as in T-H-E-R-E -E versus there T-H-E-I-R. So it's still essential that you proofread your essay. It may be worth asking someone else to proofread for you and to spot any spelling mistakes or tell you if there's some problems with your writing. I would always recommend if you choose to get someone to proofread your work, try not to use one of your classmates. It's better to use someone who is a friend on another course or someone who's not studied here at all. <coughs> it's not essential that they understand the science, just that they can read English. You need to make sure you reference correctly, avoided jargon and don't use quotations. The only time it is allowable and acceptable to use quotations in essays is where you are taking words that have been stated directly by someone. For example, a famous speech or a piece of legislation. In that case, those are unavoidable and acceptable. However, when you see a student essay that has large sections of text that have been quoted directly from a textbook, that indicates that the writer does not understand the work very well and it's a red flag to the marker. It also is a form of plagiarism or academic misconduct. Bad essays are confused with no real structure, poor referencing, so a lack of referencing or the wrong style. Lots of jargon, colloquialisms are used and it leaves the reader thoroughly confused about what you're trying to say. <coughs> the downright ugly of the essay world have no structure, no clear discussion of the topic, totally irrelevant information and appalling spelling and grammar. No referencing and is plagiarised. Plagiarism is simply where somebody has attempted to pass off work by other authors as their own. However, it will also apply if you fail to give credit to other authors where their work has been used, whether that is intentional or not. In other words, reference throughout, and if in doubt, reference. The reason referencing is so critical is because all academic work build, builds on the ideas and discoveries of previous people. So in this way we are literally standing on the shoulders of giants and every new discovery adds to the wider body of knowledge. And when we use information from any source we have to acknowledge that this is someone else's work and give them the credit they deserve. A clear and accurate reference tells the reader exactly where to find that piece of information. Including the source in a bibliography at the end of an assignment is essential but is not sufficient on its own. You must remember to do in-text referencing as well and to annotate your references. If you don't you will lose marks. Unless you've been told otherwise, it is not acceptable to reference lecture slides as a source. I do not want to see a single essay that says Boise C 2019 unless it happens to be one of my first author papers. 
Lecturers and other teaching staff have taken information from other sources and put it into our lecture slides. You'll note where we've included diagrams, you'll see a reference for where that diagrams come from. So the same requirements to reference applies to everybody. In the School of Pharmacy, we use the Harvard referencing style. This is sometimes known as the author date system and is a nice, easy way of referencing in your work. The way we reference books, journal articles and websites is very different. The sources are cited within the text, not in footnotes or endnotes. Only the author and date of the source are included in the in-text references. The title, location and publication details are contained in the bibliography itself. Another vital reason why you must reference it's self-preservation. If you put in a piece of information from a source reference and the marker either disagrees with that information or knows that it is wrong, they can go to the reference source you have used, find out where the information is. If when they look at that piece of information in the reference they find that the reference source itself is incorrect, you will not lose marks. The information will be corrected in your work, but you won't be penalised for it. If, however, you haven't put that reference in, and we physically cannot check where that information has come from, then we're stuck. We can't identify it, and you will lose the marks, as well as getting your wrist slapped for not referencing correctly. A really excellent reference source, and I'm really sorry about that terrible pun, for using Harvard to cite different types of work can be found here. This is an excellent source as it lists all the different types of source referencing material you may come across, from newspaper articles, chapters in edited books and so on. It's very, very useful and really with this you don't have any reason not to understand how to reference correctly. Okay, so some articles here, I'm going to show you some examples. So for journal articles, such as this one by Zuzolia et al, if you're writing an in-text reference, you need the author name and the date. You only need to put in the surname of the first author here, because there are five authors. If there's only two or three, then you'd be expected to write all of them out. But where you've got more than that, it's acceptable to write it et al like this. It literally means Zazulia and the others 2010. When you come to actually reference this in your bibliography, in your reference section, you need the full details of where you can find this article. So it's not enough just to put the first author. Here you need to put all of the author's names in the order they appear the year of publication, so 2010, and the title of the article in question. When you do that, you need to find the full journal title. This is J. Met, which is the Journal of Molecular Medicine. If you're not sure what a journal abbreviation is, write it in full after Googling it. If you can't find it on Google, just put the abbreviation. I would always far rather you put an abbreviated journal than no journal at all. And that's what your reference should look like when you actually have it in your in-text citation. If you're coming to reference websites, you need to identify the author first. This is always straightforward. It may be an independent identified contributor, or it could be a corporate author. It depends on what information is presented. You also need to look for the date of the article, which again may be clearly stated, or you may have to hunt for it. An example of where it's quite easy is this. This is The Scientist, which is an online scientific magazine. In this case, the particular piece of information that you've wanted it's from this feature article and here you've got a nice clear independent contributor actually named and the date 
So your in-text citation would be Asher 2017. Your full reference citation would include the rest of the details as well. So the title of the piece and the reference with the web link. It's important when you're using web pages that you write accessed on and you write the date that you accessed the information. That's because web pages are not static. They move, links can be broken. It's important to identify to your marker when you actually looked at this website. So if they go to check it and find the link is broken, it's not your fault and you are not held responsible. This one is a more difficult example. So here there is no independent identifying contributor that you can find. So you have to go hunting. At this point, it's the corporate author. So have a look at the actual web link itself. In this case, PBS Learning Media. You can also use the information on the footer. Here, the actual date that's shown on the footer is 2017. You could also use PBS and WGBH Educational Foundation as a corporate author. Either would be fine. Books are slightly different depending on the circumstances. The previous link that I showed you before from the University of Anglia Anglia actually covers books in detail. So I'm not going to dwell particularly long on here. I'm just going to give you an example. So one of your recommended textbooks, Essential Cell Biology 4th Edition. The title is obvious. The authors are actually written around that diagrammatic section on the front page. It's not always that easy to find them. So title and edition will be on the front cover. If you open the front cover and look on one of the first pages, you'll find something that looks a bit like this. The publication date for the edition is the most recent edition and most recent date. This is the fourth edition, so it's the fourth date being shown. All your authors are also listed here, along with their affiliations. You only need the actual names, not the affiliations. The country of publication is listed here. It's important to put the actual location in terms of city rather than country. So for example here you'd say it's Garland Science and that's in New York or in Oxford. You wouldn't say in America or the UK. That's what your reference would look like when you've actually dealt with it and this is a fourth edition textbook. You've just taken the information out indirectly. I mentioned before you must annotate your references. This allows the reader and the marker to identify what information you've gained from each source and confirms you've actually used it. So in this case, this is an example of how you would annotate the previous reference. You literally need one sentence. You don't need a lot. OK, so I really, really hope that this information gives you a little bit more confidence. There's some more information on the KLE under your assignment details. And there's other information in your student handbook, particularly on referencing and avoiding plagiarism. As always, if you need to ask anything, don't hesitate to contact me. Just make sure you've read the sources before you do.